I'd like to welcome everyone as well, uh, and welcome Dan. Thank you. Um, Delighted to be here. Yeah. It's a real treat. Um, and it's a real treat to have such a, a large and diverse audience um, group here. Um, um, and I, I think uh, the, the normal format for these coffee conversations is to have um, sort of us uh, engage in some dialogue for half an hour or so and then open it for mm -hmm. larger Fun. questions. Um, but in the first half hour, there may be things that come up that people want to follow up on. I'd, I'd invite you to feel free to do that. And I've brought a number of questions, um, most of which I shared with Dan ahead of time uh, in, in one form. But I think uh, looking at the audience, my sense is that there, there really are a number of different kinds of interests people may have. Darren mentioned secular humanism. There are all sorts of things about um, understanding consciousness and neuro, neuroscience and, and uh, computers and a variety of things that uh, uh, Dan has worked on um, uh, that some folks may be very interested in. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Um, I'm sorry. I, um, okay. Yeah. Thanks very much for the cue. And um, uh, questions about um, evolution and ways to, to, uh, to understand it may be another important kind of theme. Um, so, but all that by, by way of preface, maybe I, we could, it would be useful to start. Um, Dan, I just want to invite you to say a little bit about um, what drew you to philosophy in the first place. And um, what sort of your sustaining interest is. And maybe a little bit also about how um, your early formation sort of shaped the directions you went in. You worked with, with Quine, uh, Willard Van Orman Quine at Harvard, who's who, uh, sort of the dean of American philosophy uh, for the second half of the 20th century, many folks would say. And, and Gilbert Ryle, who's equally important in, in the, the British tradition. Maybe you could say a little bit about that. Well, I'm going to surprise you. OK. Um, I started off at Wesleyan, where you went to college. <laughs> and I spent my freshman year there, and I discovered Quine's work late one night in the math library. Oh. And I read from a logical point of view with his collection of essays. Stayed up all night long reading that book. And the next morning, I <laughs> put in motion the attempt to transfer to Harvard, because I figured I had to go and work for this guy. Uh -huh. uh, mainly because I thought he was interesting, but wrong. Uh -huh. And I thought, you know, as only a freshman can think, I'm going to go to Harvard and reshoot one. Yeah. Uh, so that was my goal. Yeah. And I got to Harvard and, and uh, signed up for Quine's uh, uh, philosophy of language course. And that was 1960, the year his great book, uh, Word and Object, came out. Yeah. And I was in a class with some very, very smart graduate students. I was a little sophomore. And it was very exciting. And it was just exactly what I hoped philosophy would be. Uh, because Quine was a naturalist. He, he was a secular naturalist. He, he viewed philosophy as continuous with science. Uh, and this is something I always thought philosophy ought to be. Uh, my way of putting it is, uh, in any area, no matter what inquiry you're engaged in, if you know what the right questions are, and you're just trying to answer those questions, that's not philosophy. If you don't yet know exactly what the right questions are, that's philosophy. And it doesn't matter whether you're a chemist or a physicist or a historian or a mathematician. If you're not quite sure you're asking the right questions, then you're stuck with a philosophical problem. And there are no rules, except just to be reasonable. Everything, there are no fixed points. There's no, no traditions that you have to follow. So it's, some people are very uncomfortable with that. They, they like to get their questions all neatly pressed and on a hanger, and then they can go answer them. They shouldn't be philosophers. Uh, it, it's hard to get your feet under you if you're a philosopher. And from the, and from the beginning, I was uh, impressed with the techniques of argument that philosophers used. Um, my father was a historian, my mother was an English teacher, and I grew up in a family where you could be an MD, otherwise you went into the humanities. That was just obvious. And if I'd had a different family, I would almost certainly have been an engineer. I loved building things and taking things apart and figuring out how they work. But 
if I told my, my mother, I, you know, I'd like to be a lion tamer, you know, she would have been, I think, more at ease with that than if I said I wanted to be an engineer. So I was, so for years I've been a sort of amateur, a closeted engineer. But I've, I've used that, uh, you use what you got, right? I had a, I always wanted to know how things worked and why, and I liked to tinker. And so I applied that way of thinking to philosophy. And I looked at, <laughs> why does this argument work? Or, and why shouldn't it? Why is this a, a, a bad argument, even though the conclusion is very, is very compelling? And one of the concepts I came up with when I was actually criticizing a notorious article by the by the Berkeley philosopher John Searle, uh, I said that what he'd done, it wasn't so much an argument as an intuition pump. And so what's an intuition pump? It's a device, it's, a, it's, a, it's an artifact, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a machine made of ideas, the point of which is you get your listeners to come here, and then you turn the crank like this, and when you get through, they go, I get it! And they pound their fists on the table, and they have an intuition that you've just pumped out of them. And, it, and they think, oh, now that's eye-opening. Now, it might be a logically sound argument. That could be an intuition pump. But usually it's just a sort of story, uh, a little scenario, a little example. And if you study, I love them. They're, you know, if you, Plato's Cave, that's an intuition pump. You know, remember Plato's cave, if you ever went, you know, ever took a course, or the, where the people are chained in the cave and they only see the shadows of things. Uh, Descartes' evil demon, uh, uh, fooling him about whether or not the world exists. Those are intuition pumps. And so philosophers have used these since the dawn of philosophy. Socrates has a lot of good ones. Oh, in fact, I'm gonna, let me, if I may, let me just, um, I'm gonna, I wanna ask you, I don't want anybody to say a word. I just want you to think about it. I'm going to ask you a question. And I want you to answer it in your mind. And if you think you know the answer, put your hand up. Ready? Now, nobody says anything. Is there a common four-letter word in English that ends with E-N-Y? Tell me, uh, um, uh, do you think there is such a word? Well, I haven't come up with it. Okay. So, w would you be inclined to deny there was such a word? <laughs> <laughs> Why not? So you would deny it? Sure. Okay. Would anybody else like to deny that there is such a word? <laughs> Who would like to deny that there is such a word? Who would like to deny? deny. <laughs> Who would like to deny, <laughs> deny that there is such a word? Now, you all know the word deny. It is a four-letter word ending in E-N-Y. But you didn't think of it. Some of you did. Now, I'm going to read your mind. Here's what you did. Let's see. Any, beanie, seeny, beanie, feeny, genie. Nah. You went right by it. Now, uh, that example very nicely illustrates the point that Plato made. By the way, the I got this example from a wonderful philosopher named Larry Powers, who put it in an article called Knowledge by Deduction, many years ago. Plato, in one of his dialogues in the Theotetus, has this wonderful image of what knowledge is. He says it's like, it's like you have this aviary, this giant birdcage, and it's filled with birds. That's all your knowledge. And they're yours. It's your knowledge. You've got them. The trick is to get the right one to come when you call. <coughs> And what you use to get the right birds to come when you call, those are thinking tools. And it, Socrates said it was deduction. That was the thinking tool. Oh, that's a very good one. But there's lots of others. And that's what I've been studying for 
50 years is how to make thinking tools to help us find, because you see, if you find the right knowledge, then you get the better questions. You figure out how to make better questions. So there's a little intuition pump right there. Uh, give, you, give you an example of an intuition pump. So uh, I like to talk about reverse engineering. You're prob are, are all of you familiar with that term? Some of you not? Um, when uh, General Electric sees a new product made by Sony, let's say, what do they do? They buy a few of them and they try to take them apart and figure out how they work. They reverse engineer them. What's this part for? Why do they do it this way? And they go through the whole thing as best they can, trying to find the rationale for every single feature. And sometimes there are features which are there, as it were, for no good reason. They just don't care. Eh, it works. Don't worry about it. No particular reason it should be that way. So that's reverse engineering. It's a very, I think we should recognize it as a method of thought on its own, very potent, very powerful, and of course, extremely familiar because, I claim, all, all, all of biology is basically reverse engineering. What biologists do is they reverse engineer all the species on the planet and all the interactions between all the species. And they want to know how come the, the Krebs cycle is designed like this? How come the bird's wing is designed like this? How come, how come these birds only lay two eggs? And so forth. And this, these are really potent questions, and they, they can be empirically answered sometimes uh, with a lot of hard work. So I am taking reverse engineering beyond electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and biology and looking at uh, social institutions like the institution of punishment. Why do, why does punishment, why do we have the system of laws and punishment? What, what, what do, how do the parts work and how do they mesh and what happens if you change this part? What if you drop this part off? Will the whole system fall apart? Uh, and of course, Mainly, my main work has been on, on uh, uh, how, the, how the brain works and consciousness. And there, I'm going to say one thing, and then I'm going to turn back to, to, to Gray. Our brains are sort of like our cars today. And unlike my dear old Farmall Cub tractor of some years ago. The Farmall tractor, you could see every part and you could see how and why it worked the way it did. It was, it was just a gem of transparency if you tried to reverse engineer it. A modern car today has got all these little chips and things and only, only experts and people with special diagnostic machines can figure out what the heck's going on inside. We use them but we don't understand how and why. They're like, they're like magic. There's magic under the hood. We don't even try to understand it. And that's the same with our brains. You don't know how your brain works. <coughs> maybe you even don't want to know how. Maybe you think nobody should know how the brain works. It would be, it would be a vandalism, intellectual vandalism for anybody to figure out how the brain works. We're better off with mystery. That's, in fact, a very potent attitude. I've discovered in my career. I get this headwind against me all my life. People who clearly uncomfortable, they don't want me to explain consciousness. That would be a travesty. They like, they want to preserve some mystery between their ears. Well, I'm sorry. They're not going to have it. We're, gonna, we're plowing ahead and we're going to understand how the mind works. But because of that anxiety, there's a lot of, it's hard to come up with the right questions because people want the answers to come out a certain way so they don't, they, they, they without realizing it, they sh sh 
shy away from some questions they should be asking. Um, and of course, we can, re we can reverse engineer that too. I mean, there may be a very good reason why people don't want consciousness explained. Because, why? Why might you not want consciousness explained? What, a, good, a good reason. Facing reality. Hmm? Facing reality. Fa reality. You, well, why, why would an explanation of consciousness make it harder to face reality? <coughs> Knowing the facts. Guilt. Responsibility. Guilt. Yeah, I think that's what, and I think responsibility, I think a lot of people think if my consciousness is just a lot of neural machinery, then I don't have free will and I'm not morally responsible and life has no meaning, which is sort of a downer. You know? <laughs> and so, I say, get used to it. <laughs> Yeah, one attitude is get used to it, you know. <laughs> Suck it up, baby. It's, it's, uh, uh, and I suppose a large part of my work has been to show people that consciousness explained is still not just wonderful, but more wonderful than you ever thought it was. It is absolutely fantastic, most glorious bit of engineering, biological engineering and cultural and social engineering that has ever been managed. And it does give us at least important versions of all the great magical properties that people thought minds had when they thought that minds were immaterial souls. You mind, you know, you don't have an immaterial soul. Dualism is false. You got a brain. And when you die, your brain dies. And you don't have a soul that goes to heaven. And Yet, you do have a soul. You have a something in your brain that makes you special, that makes you important, that makes life worth living, that makes you a worthy object of love and respect. And that is unlike anything in the brain of even a chimpanzee or a dolphin. It's not a magical mind pearl of immaterial ectoplasm, it's software. Your brain is the home of not 10 or 17 or 150, but of thousands of informational tools, sort of like Java applets. If you're into computers, you'll understand that. If I can't explain that. Um, I just I just finished a, a book that's coming out called Intuition Pumps and Other Tools for Thinking, and the lead sentence is by a former student of mine uh, from Sweden, Bode Album, who says, "You can't do much carpentry with your bare brain." And you can't do much thinking with your bare you can't do much carpentry with your bare hands, and you can't do much thinking with your bare brain. And he's right. If you were raised without language on a desert island, you would have a brain pretty much like a chimpanzee's, and you couldn't do much thinking at all. Most of the thinking that we can do is thanks to language. And thanks to the flood of other thinking tools that we get with the help of language. And we don't have to invent them ourselves. We get them ready-made. Long division. Um, alphabetizing a list. There's a nice algorithm that you have in your head. How to tie your shoes. You've got all these little routines in your head. Thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And they're all piled up. Virtual ma machines made out of virtual machines made out of virtual machines, just like on your iPhone. And down in the basement, it's all just machinery. It's neurons sending their little signals. 
and they're helped by the astrocytes. I have a former postdoc here who did a PhD at MIT on astrocytes. When I first heard about astrocytes, I was depressed. Because <laughs> I was just thinking I was getting used to how to think about a few hundred billion neurons. And then she tells me, yeah, but you know, astrocytes outnumber the neurons in your brain. And they're not just packing, which is what I wanted to believe. <laughs> they're doing work. And I thought, oh, it's that much more complicated. So there's an awful lot of machinery in there. Okay. Well, um, maybe uh, I, I think the themes you've raised are ones we might come back to, but um, it might be um, uh, appropriate to sort of think in terms of, you talked about biology as, and reverse engineering. Um, I'm wondering about sort of the future. And um, there are folks like Ray Kurzweil, for example, mm -hmm. who, was, who, would, who would agree wholeheartedly with you that uh, I think that uh, uh, Darwin's, part of Darwin's great idea, or da dangerous idea, as you call it, um, is that um, evolution is about algorithms. It's software, in fact. Mm -hmm. And that it's, um, in a sense, uh, substrate neutral. That mm -hmm. and, uh, someone like uh, Kurzweil wants to say, well, evolution can continue beyond where it's reached now. Uh, in fact, it is continuing. We have computers that are developing uh, forms of intelligence, and uh, mm -hmm. we're trying to get them to develop the intelligence, but also we're designing computers so that they, in fact, can evolve themselves. And that some of the principles that guide this um, would be not unlike the kinds that, um, that we find when we try to reverse engineer our understanding of, of uh, the biosphere, that mm -hmm. uh, seeking out energy and finding intelligent ways of acquiring control of it and mm -hmm. using it to generate more intelligence, mm -hmm. to generate more sort of capital to, to control energy is important. And, and Kurzweil has the, the sense that, and a number of arguments to the effect that um, over the next um, uh, 10 years, we're likely to have uh, computers that for a thousand bucks can be bought uh, that will be able to process as many instructions per second as uh, we think the human brain does, or at least one estimate. Mm -hmm. And that in 25, 30, 35 years, we're likely to have uh, computers um, that achieve a, a level of intelligence that is so far beyond humans that we, we, they will disappear on the other side of a horizon of intelligence, the, what he refers to as the singularity. They, they will be... Um, thinking about questions that we, we can't even articulate and can't understand when they're, when they're articulated for us. Um, is that sort of your vision of, of where cognitive science and, and the, this project of IBM, the sort of the smarter planet uh, vision where, yeah. where, uh, where uh, everything's going to be transistorized, it's all going to be connected to the internet, and it'll all be monitored, controlled, and directed by intelligent software. Is that sort of your vision of where we're, we're going? And, no, not? it's okay. not. Yeah. But uh, I think, yeah, I think, <laughs> why not? Uh, I, think, yeah. I think basically Ray Kurzweil has the has all the pieces, but he's put them together wrong. Uh -huh. And and he and he leaves. No, he doesn't have all the pieces. He leaves out. Um, um, he's. It's a very interesting ideology, but like most such ideologies, yeah, it makes use of. Oh, I'm going to introduce. Uh, uh, another one of my thinking tools. Well, some of the thinking tools in my book are, are bad thinking tools, they're anti-thinking tools. And one that Sidney Brenner, the molecular biologist recently named, is Occam's Broom. <laughs> <laughs> now, some of you have heard of Occam's Razor, the principle of don't multiply entities beyond necessity. Keep, keep as simple an ontology as simple a set of things possible. Well, Occam's broom is what you use to sweep un inconvenient facts under the rug. <laughs> and uh, it's what propagandists always use. They, they, they put together all the facts on their side of the case, and they weave it into a very impressive case, and then they use Occam's broom. And, and if you're not an expert, you just don't know, because you can't see what is in there. It's like Sherlock Holmes, the dog that didn't bark. You know, you can't, you, you can't hear a dog that didn't bark, and you can't see uh, an important fact which has been swept out of the picture by Occam's Broom. And I think Ray has used Occam's Broom uh, uh, pretty interestingly in his, in his propaganda for the singularity. Um, so I think everything you said that he said, I, I think I agree with. But uh, first of all, uh, 
the so I think I think in principle it is possible to make an artificial intelligence that's smarter than we are, and then that would be his singularity, and and it would uh, uh, who knows what it would want, but it would first of all it would want to be maintained, and so it would use us as slaves. We'd be computer repairmen for the rest of our lives. Uh, 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 that's what our species would be for. That's sort of his vision. But, although I think it's in principle possible, I think he is orders of magnitude off on the difficulties of doing this. Uh, uh, well, I've already mentioned astrocytes, <laughs> but uh, the, uh, uh, the level of complexity and the level of organization, again, it's in the software. You take Two hundred billion neurons and keep them alive and put them in a dish. You don't have a mind. You don't even have a working brain. That that's just the 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 power is all in the organization, and the organization that's if you like the software. And there's only uh, well, there's sort of two paths to how you could do it. You could try to do the, you could try to write the code piecemeal, you know, by hand. You could try to code up a mind. Now there is a project that's been going on for 30 years or so, uh, Doug Lenath's psych project in Texas, which is trying to uh, basically put all human, common sense. all human knowledge yeah. coded up with an inference engine so that it can, it can answer all questions. Uh, there are, I don't know how many person centuries of work that have gone into it, but it's, it's you know, forget it, it's not even close. It's, it's a wonderful thing in its way, but it isn't a mind. IBM's Watson is actually, in some ways, more impressive. But it's still, it, to turn IBM's Watson into a mind that was as competent as as an eight-year-old would, I would say, it would be a project that was more than 10 times greater than all the time and effort they put into Watson. I mean, we're, we're not even close in some regards. Uh, so I think that, uh, you know, Ray Kurzweil takes, I don't know, something like a quarter pound of special dietary supplements and pills a day because he wants to live long enough to experience the singularity. Mm -hmm. Because when the singularity comes up, he has plans, you see, he's going to move his, his software soul onto the internet and then he can live forever. <laughs> it's his dream of immortality. Uh, I love the slang name for the singularity. There's a whole lot of people that are taking this very seriously. This is the rapture for geeks. <laughs> <laughs> for nerds. <laughs> so, so if you, uh, so if you, if you want the rapture and you're and you're a software nerd, then you believe in the singularity. But but can uh, I just? Do, uh, it's, but so it, 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 is it a, then a question of time? Is it that? Well, maybe in a hundred years or three hundred years it will happen. Well, no, because or you is have your, to, your you, point that that, that yeah. the order of Magnitude of difficulty is something that somehow makes it likely to be impossible. Well, first of all, it's going to be expensive. Yeah. And who's going to pay for it? The Pentagon. <laughs> no. no. Why? Because, because, first of all, let me back up and say, yeah. since, since I've worked with, with people in AI since the 80s, and all the funding was DARPA funding. It was all Pentagon money. And the Pentagon funded some truly wacky AI projects. And you, you think, can they be serious? Well, they're giving us the money. <laughs> uh, and uh, there were a lot of people in the field that said, well, better we should spend it on this than on, I don't know, uh, cobalt bombs. Uh, but they, the, the Pentagon did learn from that. 
the, the limitations of certain kinds of AI, and they're not going to spend money on that. And what they are, of course, spending money on is something which is much more serious and important to talk about, and that's things like drones. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that is a, is a game changer of the sort that I think most people haven't really come, come to grips with. That is serious. Uh, but the, the things we should be thinking about and worrying about are not Kurzweil's singularity, but other technological surprises mm -hmm. that are, I think, uh, much more realistic mm -hmm. and much more worth thinking about. Um, the internet, fantastic, right? So good that we're all dependent on it now. Your supermarket's dependent on it. Your gas station's dependent on it. The power company's dependent on it. The banks, the television stations, the newspapers, every, the pharmacies, everything is dependent on the internet. What if the internet went away? Does your supermarket have a plan for how it would get food to put on its shelves if the internet went down? Um, happily, the internet is a brilliantly designed, hugely redundant, non-centralized system. There is no place in the world you could drop a bomb that would, that would, it's been designed, as we say, to degrade gracefully under attack. And, and, to, and it has lots of things that can take over the function. Uh, but it ain't perfect. And it is being attacked at a, at a great rate. Um, think about arms races. We've always had arms races. Since the Stone Age, we've had arms races between offense and defense. And the general rule of thumb is that offensive innovations are cheaper than defensive innovations. So when you come up with a spear, you win big time for a while until people figure out how to defend against spears. When you come up with cannons, you win until people come up with a way to defend against cannons and airplanes and so forth and so on. Defense is more expensive than offense. In software, in cyber warfare, that isn't just true. It is true by many orders of magnitude. We really don't have to worry about anybody building a thermonuclear device in their garage. It's just too expensive and you, you know, to get the fissionable material and all that. We do have to worry about terrorist groups that could steal the materials and do it. But still, that's a big operation, a very high-tech operation, and it would take uh, a lot to pull it off. High school kids in their bedrooms can attack the internet for free 10 hours a day and there's no penalty for attacking and failing. So they can try and try and try and try and try and they can get better and better and better and better at it. And the cost of protecting against this is serious. Now that's what we should be worrying about. Not, not Kurzweil's singularity, but we should be worrying about the fact that, that the internet is as good as a living thing now and we don't control it. It's, it's, we're too dependent on it. We can't shut it down. We can't stop it for a day and put it on the, on the examination table. And part of the brilliance of its design is that nobody on the planet knows exactly how all the parts work. And even committees are pretty much at the limit of their, of their knowledge. So, so we've created this, and now we need it. And uh, I think that's, we're going to have to spend so much money uh, protecting it. Oh, by the way, that, that's, it looks more and more like biology. Your, as you sit here, each one of you is about 100 trillion cells. And nine out of ten of them are not human cells. 
they are symbionts that live in you and on you. Nine out of ten of them. They have their own DNA, they have their own, they have their own genomes. <laughs> don't 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 think you don't think you're gonna don't first of all you don't want to cleanse yourself of all of these, you die. Because a lot of them you couldn't live without. For instance, all the flora in your gut, you need that to digest your food. And who knows how many others of these actually trillions of cells, how, who, who knows how many of them are actually doing useful stuff for you. So And how many are part of your sense of self? Yeah. So detente is the is the name of the game, you know? Leave well enough alone. The thing is you wanna you wanna protect yourself against the toxic ones. You want to encourage them to evolve into benign forms. Then you don't care. And there's lots of, sort of evolutionary epidemiology, evolutionary medicine that says what you really want to do is, is discourage the evolution of toxic varieties, encourage the toxic ones that exist. Don't try to eradicate them, almost impossible. Instead, <coughs> encourage them to morph into things that aren't harmful anymore. It's happening with HIV. Uh, this is the way to go. Same thing's true about the internet and about viruses on the internet. You're not going to control them all. <coughs> Get used to it. Just try to create environments where only uh, at least neutral, where, where neutral or beneficial ones are, are the order of the day and the toxic ones you can keep under control. But also expect, <laughs> expect to suffer some serious bouts of, of, of <coughs> toxic infection. Just plan for that, too. Don't, don't think you're going to, don't think you can create a marginal line that just, that just keeps it up. Well, um, one of the uh, strategies that people have for this is to, you know, go back to the, back to the land movement kind of things. Yeah. And in fact, you came to Maine. That's you're right. You're saying start here. Uh, about the time the college was started is, in, in a way, um, part, partly in, in the context of that kind of movement. And, have had a farm in Blue Hill um, since then, yeah. and um, uh, uh, you talked about, uh, uh, to some extent, your, your ways in which that feeds into your philosophy. In fact, I think Doug Hofstadter's yeah. kind of the term telosophy, telosophy. to sort of uh, characterize this kind of uh, yeah, yeah. interaction, and yeah. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about yeah. what you see as um, important and useful in the experience of farming and related kinds of things that are part of the main, the way life should be. That, yeah. In fact, for example, College Atlantic students might experience mm. when they come up here yeah. and that might provide some of the, the uh, basis for intuition pumps or other kinds of, of thinking tools that would be important for people who are going to become hematologists here at CLA. Um, yeah, when, when, when we, we bought our farm in Blue Hill in 1969 and we very much wanted to be, uh, as I say, nouveau rural, <laughs> and, uh, and we found that there were a lot of other nouveau rural uh, people of our age. And, uh, uh, but unlike most of them, uh, we didn't burn our bridges behind us. I kept my job at Tufts, and this was a, this was a sort of experimental summer hobby for us. And uh, that was, uh, we watched with fascination as all these energetic and self-righteous young couples tried and failed to make it as organic farmers in Maine. I have to say, I hope, so, I think somebody's writing a book about this, I hope they, they, uh, they do a good one. All told, I think the natives, at least over uh, Blue Hill area, were wonderfully tolerant and helpful. They, they saw the unrealistic uh, zeal of these young people, recognized it, patiently advised them, taught them what to do and what not to do, helped them bring in their crops very often, lent them a tractor when, when they needed one and so forth, uh, and then didn't rub their noses in it when they failed. It was actually a very, I'm very proud of the, of the, the natives who, uh, who watched this wave of people showing up and <coughs> full of enthusiasm and then, which did stimulate the community tremendously in many ways. And uh, then most of it, of course, ended in, in uh, instructive failures. 
but they were instructive. Pe pe we learned a lot from that. We learned a lot about just how hard it is today to farm, and it may come back. I think the 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 hope of of serious uh, farming in, in Maine is still alive, and and should be, and the world is changing enough so it may become ever more possible. But so we were just uh, sort of participant observers. We were not committed. Uh, uh, but we, and we had a farm which had three low maintenance crops, <laughs> hay, timber, and blueberries. Uh, so then we had our vegetables, we had our apple trees, we made our cider, we had our cider uh, trees and our cider pressing. We made Normandy cider for many years. We've still got to press, haven't made it for a few years. Justin, had, have you been at a cider pressing? That was the last one. What year was that? 2005? 2000? Yeah. Yeah. So, just haven't had any good apples since then, actually. Um, so, what it's done for me is, uh, well, something that, that I learned early on is, you know, philosophy is hard. Thinking is hard. And sometimes you just beat your head against the wall and you can't make any progress. So what, what, what helps is to sit down first thing in the morning and stuff your head full of whatever problem it is you're thinking about, and then go out and mow the field or till up the hay field or do some other not quite mindless job, but, but a very routine job. And I do that, and almost invariably I find after half an hour or so, I would something would bubble up into my mind, and it was the partial solution to whatever problem I was working on, and that became a sort of habit, <coughs> just going out and. Uh, uh, you, but you always have to have something that you're sort of doing with your hands, or you know, with, you know, with some machinery. You could, you know, paint, paint the barn or something like that, well, or mow the lawn, I suppose. Do the uh, dishes. <laughs> yeah, yeah every, everything, everything yeah. counts. Yeah. 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 But, um, uh, and I became uh, very interested, the engineering side of me, in what you might call vernacular engineering. Because a lot of the natives would teach me ways of doing things that you sort of didn't find in any of the books. Yes, that were Are you having trouble hearing? Oh, I have a question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Vernacular engineering. I'll just give you one example, one of my favorites. Uh, a jitterbug is a, is a homemade wood wa wagon, something that you can go out, like a homemade woods tractor that you can go out and fill up with bump sticks if you don't, can't afford a skitter, which most people can. And there's many ways of making them. But my favorite is you get a truck, and you weld a longer frame. You, you add a few feet to the, you could add many feet if you want to. And then you put a second transmission behind the first transmission so they're in line. Well now why do you do that? Because for a tractor you want to have very slow, lots of power. So when you've got two transmissions, the output of the first transmission is already spinning a lot you put it in low, it's already s turning a lot slower than, than the crankshaft on the engine is. When you put the second transmission after that, you put it in low, and it's lower still. But, are you ready for it? The lowest gear of all is reverse. double reverse. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, negation. So double reverse is forward. And reverse is a, is, a, is a better gear ratio than low. So it's, it's lower than low. So you get, you get hyper low with double reverse. And uh, so that's, if you ever see a, a rusting old truck out there with two transmissions, that's what it is. What's it called? Well, the jitterbug is the generic, but, but the double, the, um, uh, the other nice trick, Actually, I, I, it's, in, it's in the background of that picture that you ran where the, you see a track in the background and you can see the back of a woods trailer that I made there. And I learned that from Ted Grindle, how to do that back in the 70s. 
He says, if you want to make a homemade tractor, a trailer, he says, you get ash. You want to use ash for your for your main tongue, which you he made me a nice uh, uh, steel pin to go onto the towing bar, uh, and you, and you then he says you. He used a very archaic word, X. Who knows what an X is? He says, you get an X from an old truck. It's an archaic word for axle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, that's, it's 17th century English. He says, you get the X. I had to look it up. <laughs> Finally, didn't I ask him, what's an X? He said, you know, an X. <laughs> uh, so you get an axle, you get the front axle from a truck, a junker. And you weld it with the wheels pointing straight ahead. And you turn it upside down. That gives you clearance underneath. If you use the back axle, you would have very low clearance. When you turn it upside down, you get, you get a high clearance. It's the cheapest way to get high clearance for, for two wheels to make a two-wheel trailer. So that's vernacular engineering. I love that stuff. You could also just reverse the shackle. Right? So the shackle on the top. More clearance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You had a, a question right yeah. here. Was it on the, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, it, while you were talking, um, I kept thinking <coughs> in more evolutionary biology sense of, um, you know, the intuition punk being kind of uh, really a uh, Darwinian uh, survival of the tool, in other words, to proliferate, to be outsmart, to be able to survive. And so if you, for example, do a Mendelian cross between a drone and artificial intelligence, and um, it seems to me that, you know, humanity could experience sort of a Permian or a Cretaceous um, wipeout. Yeah, yes, there could be a mass extinction. Yes. Mass extinction. And so philosophically, and you know, you're inter in the sense of humanity, that there, there's some apparent uh, altruism or reciprocal altruism, but really, isn't the Darwinian survival of the fittest where you could even make humans obsolete um, a distinct possibility? How philosophically, or is anyone thinking along those lines of just sort of more benign? Oh yeah. In fact, in fact, it's a, it's not even a cottage industry anymore. It is a, it is a leading uh, academic pursuit now in a number of fields. Sort of evolutionary game theoretic models of evolution of, of 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 altruism and of cooperation. And there's a, currently there's a big fuss going on because E. O. Wilson and David Sloan Wilson have. Uh, and Martin Novak at Harvard have published some pieces about group selection, right, right. which the rest of the community thinks is, uh, is nonsense, quite frankly. But I mean, it seems to be a game changer, I guess is what I'm getting at, when you have smart drones or, or you know, machines that replicate themselves and make us into slaves or something. Machines that replicate themselves is going to be a game changer. Yeah. And and we don't really have them yet, although people are, are working on it. Um, um, even, well, Tom Ray's Tierra was a software, a, self, a, a replicating software. You could have evolution inside, inside a computer where these little software uh, snippets would, would multiply and eventually they'd fill the core memory of the computer with, with their offspring. Uh, pretty scary. And uh, that was the start of the field of artificial life, which, uh, I mean, Tom Ray's work was some of the first of that sort. And it spawned as a journal, Artificial Life. I'm on the editorial board on that. It's sort of sputtering along now after 10 or 15 years of, of intermittently interesting work. But people now realize, I think, how much it's harder. First of all, there's wonderful uh, uh, computer models of evolution at work. 
And it re they really do, they really do evolve wonderful functional properties. Charles Sims' work, it, I particularly uh, admire, but there's lots of others. But they run into an interesting uh, limitation. If you do a computer model of an evolutionary system, what you do is you have you may have a very nicely modeled physics in which these a virtual world in which the virtual creatures interact and move and you can turn them into much better locomotors, much better jumpers, much better swimmers. But the the genome is backstage. It's not in the world. It is it is just part of the backstage implementation. And so it is not under selection pressure. And it, it's, it's like a, a magic oracle. It simply puts together new genomes based on the success of the individuals in that virtual world and then they create offspring. But the, 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 the developmental process and the genome itself are not part of the simulated virtual world. So that, for instance, in those worlds, you could never double up a chromosome. You could never add, uh, as it were, new loci to the genome. You couldn't enlarge a genome. Because that requires evolution to happen on the very genetic material itself. Well, that's when machines become all powerful, they're robots. But when you, when you start, then, if you then start building, you say, all right, cool, so we'll put the, we'll put the genome in the virtual body. world. And there is a system, Echo, John Holland and his colleagues did system Echo, where they did, uh, before an organism could reproduce in that virtual world, it had to gather the raw materials from the environment to make its own genome, to make the genome of the successor. So in that world, uh, the, the, the genetic process was itself under selection. Uh, but the cost of doing that was, uh, that had to drastically simplify the world. And my insight into this is that when you think about evolution in biology, what you realize is that it's a process that thrives on noise. It thrives on not just cosmic radiation, but every kind of non-functional intrusion. <laughs> drought. Dust and drought and bumps and shadows and vibrations and cosmic rays and floods and all of this stuff. And any bit of noise is an opportunity for serendipity and turning it into a signal. And if you don't have a hyper noisy environment, you don't get open-ended evolution. But the whole point of computer environments is that they're hyper Disembodied. Well, they're disembodied only in the sense that they're hyper quiet. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question right behind you here. Oh, your, your left shoulder devil. <laughs> okay. Um, I've got a question about um, this idea of, of reverse engineering, yeah. especially as it regards to consciousness. If you're essentially reverse engineering it into the brain, um, you are, yeah, I mean, you only reverse engineer something that you're satisfied with the outcomes. Like IBM gets the, the Samsung technology and they can, you know, they can um, make something that reproduces the function that you see. But then you're constantly <coughs> presented with anomalies, um, broader horizons of psychological, psychic experience that makes you need to alter the program to, um, yep. to essentially be satisfied. What makes you think that um, that that these anomalies and, and broad uh, broad horizons that you have to constantly bring in are in some way finite that, that they aren't um, infinitely expensive? Oh, I think probably they are uh, indefinitely expansive. So we're always playing catch up. Um, but. That doesn't mean we can't understand them. We, we can get better and better and better understanding. 
but it always leaves a horizon of, of things that we don't understand or, or, or interactions that we don't yet haven't imagined and we haven't anticipated. And when we discover one, then we... Uh, but, you know, we're used to that now. Um, so think about, about again, uh, about software. Microsoft Word, let's take you know, Microsoft <laughs> Word. Um, <laughs> they have some of the best software engineers in the world working on that. I mean, they've been working on it for years. And there's still bugs. They find bugs all the time that they never imagined were there. You beta test it, you fix all the bugs. How many times have, have, you, have you bought software and then there's a new release or there's a patch that you have to download? And that's never going to stop. Software is that. And, and, and Microsoft Word is orders and orders of magnitude simpler than the, the software that runs your consciousness. So, you know, don't hold your breath <laughs> for an explanation. We're, we're going to be debugging it for centuries. Then, then, then it, it, it is uh, considered to be infinite. Would that um, underlying project to reduce it all to a uh, physical structure? I don't see why. Um, let's take something that's infinite that we can reduce to a physical structure very easily. Arithmetic. Um, a hand calculator is all you need to do perfect arithmetic if you're careful um, and we understand how it works and why and we can add more memory and we can add more, more uh, 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 spaces uh, for more digits and we can keep on going and we know enough about arithmetic and about hand calculators to know that we really don't have to worry about someday discovering that 17 kazillion plus 17 kazillion isn't 34 kazillion. You know, uh, I think that so infinity and under having a having a finite but but practically perfect understanding of something which nevertheless has has an infinite dimension doesn't seem to me to be and that's what mathematics is all about. So you saying that that consciousness itself is constructed of the same kind of, of say rules like, like mathematics even it, it's infinite because of its rules that that then we represent it physically with the numbers. Consciousness itself would have to have those sorts of in effect, yes. Your brain is finite. It is unbelievably big, but it's finite. And there's no miracles in there. It's all just nerve signals and modulation of nerve signals and changes in the plasticity of neurons. And we're developing models that show how those can be put together to do all kinds of perceptual work and memory work and so forth. Um, as I know, there's no yawning chasm, there's no thing that every human mind can do that has the theoreticians just scratching their head and wondering thing, I can't imagine how we could ever get, uh, you know, have a computer model of that. Maybe we're just not looking in the right places, but I, I, I think that the, the magic of consciousness is being uh, broken down into comprehensible parts at a great rate. It's really exciting times because now we're beginning to understand how you can get that magic with a bunch of tricks. <laughs>